Uh, okay, everyone. What's up? Goldie here. Uh, and I'm going to be going over uh, the final week of the regular season, week 18 here in the NFL. Um, we have quite a few teams on the slate that actually do have something to play for, which is nice. Uh, we have other teams that we can fully ignore. Uh, and maybe some, some attackable spots with some teams that I think uh, you know are still going to be coming out firing with their number one guys. So, um, that said, uh, you know, I would like to go over, um, all of the playoff scenarios and everything, but that this video will go like three and a half hours long if we do that. Like, so it's, it's pretty convoluted. Um, but suffice to say that, uh, the teams that we can target here, just kind of right off the bat, uh, that do have something to play for and are jockeying for pretty significant seating, um, are Buffalo and Cincinnati, Pittsburgh. Uh, San Francisco, the Chargers, potentially, uh, Philly, Dallas, and Seattle. Um, uh, New England as well, uh, I guess, and, and Baltimore. Um, so there's still some some number one guys that we can, and some number one offenses that we can target. Um, but this really does open it up for a lot of opportunity uh, for some backup guys on some of the other teams, you know, at uh, really sort of deflated or decreased price tags than we're used to, to paying normally. So um, a lot of opportunity that we're going to have to try and project. There's a lot of variance in the final week of the NFL season. So uh, keep that in mind and try and project opportunity and guys that are going to be on the field as much as possible because there's a, a lot of variance with the number one offenses. Guys are likely to you know, in some instances, just to get a couple series, come out and, and just sit the rest of the game. They'll play a half or they'll do whatever. You know, so projecting volume for number one guys, uh, certainly on teams that don't have a lot to play for or um, you know, maybe maybe do and the game just turns into a blowout or something. I mean, there's, there's a lot of sort of risk that we have to consider that we don't normally throughout the regular season when we get into week 18 here. So um, that said, you know, briefly, we'll just kind of go over the quarterback room. As you can see, the the quarterback room actually looks uh, pretty stacked here this week. We got a bunch of guys still in the projections. Um, and overall, we are mostly pretty spread out. However, of course, we at least later in the week. This is Thursday now. I tried to wait as long as possible to get this out this week just to wait for as much news um, to filter out as we could get. But, you know, here we are Thursday, and it looks like Josh Allen's going to lead the quarterback room in ownership. And that almost certainly means that Steph Diggs and some Gabe Davis types of plays are, are going to be seeing some ownership. Um, so perhaps some exploitability and, and maybe reduced ownership for some of the other guys. I think there's some other quarterbacks here that we can we can consider getting to that are far less popular, at least in the initial kind of ownership projections. Um, and I think there's some spots that we can attack, but we're going to have, I'm not going to go through all of the, the, the quarterback stuff here. We got a bunch of backups that are playing. You got Sam Ellinger, you got Skylar Thompson, uh, you got Sam Howell for Washington, right? You got Terod Taylor for the Giants. All, like, you got guys everywhere. Um, and that's just in a quarterback room. So you're going to have backup running backs, backup receivers, all of this kind of nonsense that you're going to have to project. So I would, um, overall, as a general strategy, take it easy and and don't, don't play a ton um, unless you're just really, really dialed uh, or you... you you really like punting because uh, there's a hell of a lot of variance in the final week of the season, even though we've got a lot of teams with um, with some stuff to play for. So that said, let's just kind of get into it real quick. Um, Minnesota is one of these teams that really doesn't have a hell of a lot to play for. For all intents and purposes, they're locked into the three seed here in the NFC. Um, there's an outside chance if San Francisco, Philly, and Dallas lose and they beat Chicago that Minnesota can capture the one seed. Um, obviously, that's incredibly unlikely here. So for most, uh, you know, for our purposes, I think we can just consider Minnesota locked in to the three. Uh, they can they can also win the two if something crazy happens as well. Um, can't drop down to the four, though. Tampa is locked into the four over there. So the worst they can do is three, and it's super unlikely that they move up. So for the most part, that means that Minnesota 
probably doesn't have a hell of a lot to um, to play for and, and really go after on offense, which means eating a normal price tag on Justin Jefferson, normal price tag on Kirk Cousins, and Dalvin Cook and TJ Hawkinson and Adam Thielen is probably a little bit aggressive. Uh, same thing with the ownership. We're seeing you know, depressed ownership that we would otherwise uh, when Minnesota is getting Chicago, right? Um, so there's that. But for the most part here, uh, I think we're probably likely to see Minnesota's offense kind of take it easy. They don't have to win the game because they can't drop to the four seed. Um, and they could very well just just kind of concede that they're super unlikely to win the one or the two um, and just, just kind of take their three seed and, and – limp into the playoffs um so that said that takes me personally completely off of the entire minnesota offense uh outside of maybe some kj osborne or some alexander madison i think these are the two guys that would benefit in the event that the the number ones end up sitting certainly alexander madison um he gets carries on a regular basis throughout the season at 5100 i think this is one of our cheaper running back plays that we could consider mixing into our pools. There's a bunch of these guys this week. So he's definitely one of them. Uh, Minnesota normally doesn't run the football whole hell of a lot, but it's probably going to be Nick Mullins coming in and spelling Kirk Cousins. Um, In that event, that very likely event, I I would say, um, you could see an uptick in volume for the Minnesota rush game here. They, they haven't been efficient all year, and that's why Dalvin has been so frustrating to play. But, um, I mean, it, Dalvin Cook at 7,300 is, is a total non-starter um, at this price. So, uh, really the only pieces I would consider would be KJ and Alexander Madison. I'm less on KJ at 47. I think there's other guys that are likely to get a more solidified workload. Um than KJ, even in the event that, that both of these guys are out, because I'm not sure that the Minnesota offense is really going to come out chucking it as nearly as often as they they do with Cousins back here, right? Uh, and certainly with Fields not playing on the other side, this is very likely to be a super slow game uh, and very rush-heavy top to bottom. So uh, Alexander Madison, favorite piece here from the Vikings. Vikings defense at 2,900. This is playable. Um Chicago didn't throw the ball, and that's really Minnesota's biggest weakness, of course. 2900 it's a good price, and over 20 in value score, it's fine. I, I'd be careful eating a lot of ownership uh, for a defense this week. You're probably going to see some guys steam into the weekend, or some, some defenses steam into the weekend. Um, and I think in Week 18, it's probably one of the, it's probably one of the weeks where we want to avoid eating a lot of defensive ownership um, really compared to normal weeks throughout the season um, due to the natural variance that comes with playing a defense, right? And, um, and of course, guys on defense may be sitting as well, right? So that's, that's something we have to consider. But uh, if we think that all of that stuff is baked into the projections, I'm not sure that it is necessarily. Um, so I think we do have to do a little bit of fundamental research on our own, but, uh, you know, it's a seven and a half point projection and two and a half value score and and over 20 and or two and a half point per dollar and over 20 in value. I mean, these are all fine. Um, so you can play, you can play them because Chicago's offense is terrible and their best athlete is not going to play. So it is going to be, uh, backup quarterback, Nathan Peterman here at 4,800, not touching him, even though the Vikings defense is a sieve, um, now, Peterman is not great, right? And he'll probably be turning the football over uh, a hell of a lot more than some of the other backup quarterbacks. But, um, you know, that said, I mean, he's not hes not the worst backup quarterback in the league, I, I would say. I mean, he's probably pretty close. But um, it, it, that said, they're not going to be throwing the football a hell of a lot anyway. Uh, and with David Montgomery and Khalil Herbert here, the most of the work is just going to go to these two guys. David Montgomery is 6,500. I would probably, I think this is okay. And normally I don't like attacking the Minnesota rush defense because they're, they're actually a pretty decent unit. It's the pass defense. that's so bad. Uh, very similar to Miami. Uh, it, it's just a pass funnel, but at a 6,500 price tag for Montgomery, I think, Khalil Herbert, like his numbers this season are actually fantastic efficiency wise. He hasn't, he hasn't gotten a lot of, um, 
of actual target work, um, or carry work rather, and since he's come back from his, his little couple week absence, uh, really just six targets each, each week, I think. Um, but that said, this could be a week where you see an uptick in volume for him. And in deeper tournament pools, I think at 4,600, if you need to save this salary, uh, he's definitely the most talented wide receiver down here at this price tag, or uh, talented running back, rather, at this price tag. So I think this is a playable piece. Uh, David Montgomery, I think, is also playable in tournaments. Uh, I would certainly just have upside concerns at the at this price tag. And I think there's plenty of other running backs that I think I'd rather get to. Um, and certainly at, at full 8% ownership, it seems a little elevated give me, given how many other guys that we can play. So uh, I do like Herbert and, and Montgomery, of course. I'm not touching any of the Chicago passing offense, uh, even Cole Komet, who is effectively their number one. Bears defense, 2,600. I think this is a if you land on it, it's probably okay. Um, once again, they're a bad, bad defense, and uh, I, even against a backup quarterback and Nick Mullins over there, um, they're probably not going to be run it, rushing the ball, as I mentioned, as or excuse me, throwing the ball as, as much as uh, at normal. So um, opportunities for the Bears' defense probably decreased in that regard as well. So uh, probably staying off of it, uh, but if you land on a defense at 2,600, it, it's not the worst play in the world pretty much ever okay um we'll try and keep all of this quick and try and keep it under an hour um jets here don't have anything to play for of course uh miami actually does they can still make the playoffs they need a little bit of help i believe but um so we could see a a little bit more competitive environment than we're likely to see in the first game for sure mike white and garrett wilson here i think these are playable constructions um playable stacks in in deeper tournament stuff probably wouldn't be getting to them in 20 max here just not a lot of upside for the jeff's offense just in general i think it's okay because miami's pass funnel defense is very very attackable and Miami's going to have to score and, and try and score and try and win this game to make the playoffs. So uh, Jets' defense is certainly still going to make that difficult on them. So um, you could see some, I, I guess, outcomes where, where Mike White, Garrett Wilson, maybe a Corey Davis uh, actually do end up producing a, a, to a respectable um, level here. So I uh, would be careful with a 5,800 um, he's going to be one of the few pieces this week, Garrett Wilson, that are going to spike in ownership. And there's going to be a lot of guys. We've got a full docket here, full 13 games. A uh, lot of guys that we're going to be able to get to and eating ownership on a highly volatile position. We saw Garrett Wilson just shit the bed last week in a pretty damn good spot against the Seahawks. Um, you know, they, they didn't, their offense didn't do anything. So uh, I'd probably... Uh, Risk tolerance-wise, my personal preference is to come in light on this, and if they burn me, they burn me. Um, you know, that's okay. But I think I'd rather get to some places where I think the volume is, and the ownership, the volume is going to be a little more solidified, and the ownership is not nearly as high. So um, in cash, if you're playing cash this week, I mean, good luck to you. But uh, I think it's a fine fine play just click on him again it, it, it's perfectly fine he's still going to get his 8 10 targets he just didn't produce anything with those targets last week so uh i think it's still fine bam knight would be a a, a pretty good price adjusted play here otherwise um but he gets miami's rush defense it's actually a, a decent unit and the Jets rush offense not really a decent unit so um 51 i think there's probably other plays I would prefer. We'll get to some of those than a than a, a Bam night here. Not a lot of upside for the Jets rush offense. Just kind of in general, um, you'd really need Miami to be shitting the bed here. I think to uh, to be attacking this and going out of your way to to include some Bam nights. So really, no thank you. Jets defense still the best unit on the field here. Um, given that Skylar Thompson's going to be the starter on the other side. Now Miami is going to be throwing the football. And at 2,600, I'd much rather play the Jets here than uh, than the Bears, of course, right? Like, and at basically the same ownership, I mean, it just seems like the play just very, very easily. Um, nearly three point per dollar, mid 20s value score for for a defense down. This is excellent. This is a really, really good fundamental unit and a pretty damn good spot against a team that can score, of course, but gets a, a backup quarterback or third string quarterback even. 
and they will be throwing the ball. So there's going to be opportunity here for the Jets' defense to uh, to create a little bit, and they could rush the passer a little. So um, I think there's some upside here at 2,600 for the Jets' defense. For Miami's offense on the other side, I think this is a playable unit. If you want to play some deeper tournament stuff with Skylar Thompson, I don't think this is bad at all. Um, you might have to force some of it in because you're naturally just going to get a, a ton of the – higher projected quarterbacks, right? Um, but at 15% or 15 points rather for a $4,800 quarterback, I, this is not a, a, a bad number at all. Three Oh point per dollar and, and low 40, low to mid forties value score here is a pretty good number for a quarterback, no matter where he, he's priced. So uh, I think there is a little bit of upside given how much off there, how much the Miami offense throws the football and once again, they got to come out firing here to try and make the playoffs. So Tyreek and Jalen Waddell, they're expensive themselves, but a $4,800 quarterback makes that a little bit more palatable here. Same thing with the Trent Sherfield. If you want to mix that in, you can play a Tyreek, a Skyler, and a Trent Sherfield. And then uh, if you if you want to run it back with a Garrett Wilson on the other side, I think that's okay. You know, it it's a deeper tournament construction, but it allows you to get to a lot of different um, a lot of a lot of different constructions in in deeper tournament builds. So um, in a lot of different you know expensive uh, receivers and running backs and, and all that kind of stuff that allows you to get there. So um, this is this is playable over here. Uh, I would. Once again, stay off of the Miami running back room. Um, Jets' rush defense is fantastic, and these guys are splitting carries, and they're kind of expensive. So uh, a lot of other running backs I think it, we'd rather get to when Miami rush game isn't very good to begin with. Dolphins over here against a mediocre offense uh, at 3,000. Probably, I mean, I'd certainly much rather just play the Jets on the other side um, and save a little bit of money and save – some in the ownership department as well. So um, that's that game. New England and Buffalo, actually both teams here have something to play for. New England is still trying to jockey for seeding, I believe, and Buffalo is doing the same. Um, if if Kansas City loses, I believe Buffalo can still make or can still win the number one. Um, we're not totally sure just yet if the – Cincinnati and Buffalo game is going to be played uh, by most accounts earlier this morning. This is Thursday when I'm recording this. Uh, the The game is probably going to get canceled, in, in which case it makes it that much more difficult for Buffalo or Cincinnati, for that matter, to capture the number one seed. They would need Kansas City to lose. I think Kansas City would be drawing dead to the number one in that event. Um but Buffalo would need Kansas City to lose, and Buffalo would need to win. So this is very likely to be a competitive game still nonetheless because New England and Buffalo, they're still jockeying for seeding uh, no matter where everything ends up. Most scenarios, uh, New England's going to end up, I believe, as the five. Um, that I could be wrong about that, but Buffalo is almost certainly going to be the two. So uh, that said, Buffalo's defense is actually relatively attackable, and they're more attackable through the air than they are on the ground, still pretty efficient on the ground in rush defense. Um, and unfortunately, we really like playing Ramondre. Like, the kid is exceptionally explosive, and he's got all the upside in the world to blast through a $6,700 price tag and a 15-point aggregate projection, but... Once again, the New England rush offense isn't all that explosive itself, and Ramondre still hasn't gotten more than 20 carries all but once this season, right? And Damian Harris did come back, and he got 10 carries, I believe, last week, or 9 carries last week. So at 5,300, um, you can't play Damian, but he cuts into Ramondre's work a pretty significant amount, and the Bush Buffalo rush defense is a still you know, relatively respectable unit. So it kind of takes me off from Andre once again, even though I really, really like the kid and would like to play him pretty much every week. Um, that said, at the, you know, I'm, I think most of the upside is probably priced in at 67. Um, but that said, at 6% ownership, I mean, <laughs> this is a damn good tournament play. Uh, he has the upside, and if you're giving me 20 to 1 uh, on Ramondre 
hitting 25 points or something this week, I think you probably got to take it, right, with a 15-point aggregate projection. So um, that's really kind of what the ownership is implying here, that he's just a super dog to, uh, to, to blast through 25 points, which I think is we may have gotten a little bit carried away here. So I, I would be interested in getting some exposure to that, but not in super outsized proportions. Definitely not a, a 20% type of ra uh, rate or anything like that. I think 15 is plenty. Um, even like 12 or something is, is probably plenty to get uh, Ramondre here. I would most often like to attack with the passing game. That's Mac Jones and Jacoby Myers. Maybe a little bit of Kendrick Bourne. Now, no ton Hunter Henry for me at 3,300. Just doesn't get the volume. Um, this is a Matt Patricia offense over here, and Matt Patricia, let's not forget, he didn't use T.J. Hawkinson, right, in, in Detroit. So, um, not using the, the tight end over here in, uh, in New England pretty much at all. So, it's just Jacoby and deeper tournament darts with Kendrick Bourne. Um, probably some other guys with more solidified volume shares that I'd like to target this week than Kendrick Bourne. But if you're building a bunch of these teams in this game, stacking this game a, a bunch of ways, I would include him for sure into your pool. Uh, but Jacoby would be the number one, and he's one of the fewer, one of the few pieces that I would prefer uh, just eating some ownership on and, and getting to it. Because once again, New England has to win this game, and the most exploitable spot is through past, Buffalo's past defense. So... I think this is a fine play, mid uh, two and a half point per dollar, and uh, over 30 in value score for a 5K number one receiver. It's uh, it's a pretty strong play, um, even at fo the current 14% ownership that he's garnering at the moment. Uh, Patriots defense, I'm almost certainly staying off of this. However, this is a very very good unit, a very very good price, 2,200. And let's not forget that Josh Allen could turn the football over. Um, now, I know all of us would really like to play the Buffalo narrative here, um, but we have to kind of balance range of outcomes here. And it, it's still possible that um, that a very good defense over here in New England, like New England can cover this this seven points here. This, this team is very capable uh, of covering this number and actually winning this game outright. It, it's very possible. So... Um, the Patriots defense could very well be the route or one of the routes that contribute to them covering a number and winning a game. Um, at nearly three, 2.9 point per dollar and, and over 20 in value score, it's the projection that's keeping it low. Uh, but it's still a, a very playable price tag for a very playable unit. Uh, Buffalo on the other side, um, I, I do... You know, despite going off on on the Patriots defense just now, I, I do really like the Buffalo offense here. I think this is a good spot for them to to really bounce pretty hard, um, and I think you'll see a lot of the field taking the same sort of approach, and that is really kind of reflected in the early ownership figures: 12% on Josh Allen right now, and 11% give or take on Steph Diggs. Um, I like the 11% on Steph Diggs. I think this is a really good play at 7,900, to be quite honest, even you know, despite the fact that New England's pass defense is a pretty damn good unit. Um, I think getting to the number one receiver with with Josh here is is very warranted, and we have plenty of value. We're not really striving for um, and strapped for cash or anything, so I think this is very playable, but be careful in what kind of tournaments you're playing that these numbers on, on Allen and Steph Diggs just kind of steam a little bit. Um, in that event, what you could do is take some shorts on the Bills and play the, the Patriots defense on the other side. Uh, if you do want to stack, I would run it back with Jacoby Myers. You could also stack with Gabe Davis here at 5,400. Um, I think he is a deeper tournament play. We've always just have sort of volume concerns with Gabe. Um, he's only getting five seven targets a game or whatever it is, but he's got some upside to, and he's got some touchdown equity. He, Allen does look for him in the red zone, probably staying off of the running back room here at 5,800 for Singletary. And unfortunately 5,000 for James Cook. Sorry if you can hear my dog kind of chewing on his toy in the background here. Um, at these two price tags, uh, I'm, I'm really not enthused about getting to him against a really good rush defense unit. Uh, Devin Singletary, I think, is wholly unplayable. James Cook is actually incredibly, incredibly efficient. 5.8 yards a carry or something this season. Um, very, very strong efficiency metrics for Cook. But 
still just splitting carries and not getting the number one workload here. If there's other guys that will be getting a more solidified workload, um, you know, than James Cook here. So I, I think it's probably only deep tournament plays and only in stacks that you could consider, uh, but really not in, in any outsized proportions here. Bill's defense, 3,800. This is kind of a stiff price tag. Um, I think there's other units down here, specifically Dallas, Philly, and San Francisco, who we'll get to if we're paying up, um, that I think I'd prefer to get to. Not that I'm scared of New England's offense necessarily, but um, I think the other defenses are just in better spots. So that's kind of how we're, I would like to approach the New England Buffalo game here. Both teams have something to play for. Um, so we can target some pieces, mostly Buffalo with some runbacks on the New England side. Um, all right. Two teams with something to play for here as well in the uh, Baltimore and Cincinnati game. Once again, um, I mean, Baltimore, I believe, can actually still win the division here. If they win this game, they would win the head-to-head -head or one of the tiebreaker matchups, I believe, against Cincinnati, which is kind of crazy. Uh, maybe not. I could be making that up. They could be a game behind an, an overall record. Certainly, if if the Buffalo-Cincinnati game does not get resumed, um, I believe since he's sitting at 11 and four right now, I could be wrong. And Baltimore's at 10 and six. So um, if that game doesn't get re resumed and it's just canceled, then I don't think Baltimore could win the the AFC North. In any case, they're still jockeying for the five seed with the Chargers down here are the Ravens. So they still have something to play for. And on the other side, since he still trying to win the number number two seed. They don't really want to drop to the three. Um, you know, but so I, I think in this game, we could see, you know, a com pretty competitive environment as competitive as a Tyler Huntley led Baltimore Ravens uh, super boring offense can really be, I suppose. Uh, but Lamar Jackson, I don't think has practiced yet. And um, I think it's going to be just the Tyler Huntley show at 4,900. And I still don't think he's all that playable. He is projecting better than some of the other 4,900 quarterbacks that we've got. Uh, so it's an all right number. And if you want to run a deep tournament team with like a Tyler Huntley and a Demarcus Robinson, I think this is a pretty cool play, to be quite honest. Super low ownership. Nobody's going to have this. And Demarcus Robinson is 3,600. He is the number one wide, re wide receiver on the team. Obviously, you have Mark Andrews here at 54, but... 3,600 for a number one wide receiver, that, that's insane. I don't think we've really ever seen that. I don't remember a number one ever being this this cheap. Um, so I think this is just a spot where you, you just buy it, and if it doesn't, <laughs> if you don't get there, you don't get there. Uh, it, is, it is crazy to me. Um, now, with Mark Andrews, I don't want to get outsized exposures to him necessarily at 5,400. The the volume with Tyler Huntley just has not been there. And if we're eating 16% ownership on the guy, I mean, that that kind of makes me balk a little bit. Um, even though the point per dollar and value metrics here at a 13.5 projection, give or take, are pretty respectable for a $5,400 uh, skill position player. Still, I think there's some better tight end plays that we could probably get to that are likely to see a, a more solidified workload, uh, even though this is Mark Andrews, and he's definitely the number one receiving option in the offense. Uh, he just hasn't shown it with Tyler Huntley yet. I think we can get some pieces, but coming in overweight to the field at 16% at ownership seems a little bit um, aggressive for my taste. Uh, the Ravens, however, they just want to run the, run the, the offense rather through... Uh, the running game. And most of that, of course, does come from Lamar, but he won't be around. So it's JK and it's Gus Edwards. And both of these guys still getting target or still getting work and carries. And at 57 for JK, even though he's very, very explosive, I'm not sure I really want to go after Cincinnati's rush defense here. Um, overall, pretty decent unit in suppression. Only give up to about 24 attempts a game. JK is not going to get all of those, right? So you're only going to see 15, 18 carries from J.K., and Cincinnati only gives up about 4.2 yards a carry and less than 100 yards a game on the ground. So two really, really good rush defenses here in this game with Baltimore and Cincinnati. So I'm probably just going to be staying off of the uh, the, the running backs almost entirely. Um, 
do like the the Demarcus Robinson play. You can play him as one off. You could also consider playing him in, in stacks here. Uh, okay, Cincinnati on the other side. Let's get to this quickly. Um, really like Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase. Love the the passing game here for the Bengals. Um, I'd almost prefer them to Buffalo as far as an expensive stack. Um, and certainly if I'm getting a, a decent ownership discount on the quarterback alone, I mean, obviously you have a rushing upside with, with Josh Allen, but he's 1100 more expensive, you know, and Joe Burrow has just as much upside in the passing game alone as Allen does collectively. So, um, I think I'd prefer to get to the Bengals and currently at these, at these ownership numbers, I mean, I, like field is, is mostly ignoring it. So I think this is okay at, 7% for, for Joe Burrow. I think it's a pretty damn good play. Um, 50 in value score for a quarterback. Really, really strong. Jamar Chase, 8,400. Thinks this is a very, I think he's underpriced here. Baltimore pass defense is very attackable. 11 yards a catch, 6 adjusted net yards per attempt nearly for the Ravens defense. They give up a huge completion percentage as well, 67 full percent. And Joe Burrow, we know, is incredibly efficient at, at 69% himself. So, um, a really, really good efficiency spot here for the Bengals passing offense and Jamar Chase. Certainly, you can get to T. Higgins as well at 7,600. You can play Tyler Boyd also. I know he caught the touchdown at uh, in that in that Bills game in that first quarter at 4,600. I think this is an okay price for him. Probably some other guys I would prefer to get to that are in a more solidified role than the number three receiving option. Um, and Tyler Boyd, of course, is still dealing with a busted finger or whatever it is. I know he's you know, if he gets five targets or something, seven targets, um, you know, you don't really care about that, but he's still got to catch the ball and you probably need him to get into the end zone a little bit uh, at this price tag. So not my favorite down here at 46, but certainly playable if you're if you're playing Cincinnati stacks. Hayden Hurst has seen a little bit of an uptick in volume since he's come back healthy, um, but still not using, I mean, he's the fourth receiving option or maybe even the fifth if you consider Mixon as as the fourth receiving option in the offense. So uh, it's an okay point per dollar and, and value play here. And, and certainly you can mix him in. Nobody's going to play him uh, to, to stacks. Um, but as, as a one-off, probably concerned a little bit with upside for Hayden Hurst. Bengals defense, 3,700. Uh, once again, probably too expensive. I think there's just... Um, there's other defenses that we'll get to a little bit later that I think I'd rather play. Quickly, we'll get to the running game. I did mention I don't want to touch it. And at 7,100 for Joe Mixon, I think it's just I think it's just too expensive. Uh, we know he has upside, and a little bit of the rushing downside is mitigated when we are paying 71 for Joe Mixon because he has receiving game upside, of course, right? So he's still fine, but the point per dollar and value metrics are, are a little bit lower than we'd like to see for somebody up here north of 7,000. And at a full 10% ownership, uh, I think there's other running backs that we can play. The far better fundamental spot here for the Bengals is the is the passing game. And they want to throw the football anyway. They're a 57-43 pass-heavy split. So getting to an elevated um, or a Joe Mixon at an elevated price tag in what's not a really good fundamental spot at all. Ravens only give up 3.9 yards, carry 95 yards a game on the ground. Uh, excellent unit over there. Really not a hell of a lot of upside at this price tag for Mixon. So that totally takes me off of Samaj P. Ryan, uh, certainly at 5,400 as well. Uh, so that's kind of how I want to attack with the Bengals, mostly the passing game, getting to uh, the usual suspects, Burrow, Chase, T. Higgins, and running it back maybe with a Demarcus Robinson or even a Mark Andrews. I think those are playable constructions for sure. Uh, okay, Cleveland and Pittsburgh. Let's get to this quickly. Deshaun Watson actually looked pretty okay last week. He and uh, Amari Cooper connected for a couple of scores. Um, I think the performance for Amari in general is is buoyed by catching those two touchdown passes, but he did crack 100 yards, caught whatever it was, seven, eight balls, something like that. So good target work for Amari. And DPJ is still kind of seeing his sort of shallower um, PPR type of work. At, at 4,700, I think this is still playable in general. Uh, same thing with Amari at 6,000. I think in this game in particular, we're likely to see a competitive environment. Pittsburgh, on the other side, has something to play for still. They're trying to get into the playoffs. And Deshaun Watson, I mentioned last week that we were probably unlikely to uh, to see him at a super reduced and, and playable price tag given 
the the downsides of the offense uh, this season, well, we're we're now actually kind of getting it. Fifty six hundred, I think, is one of these, um, you know, starting quarterbacks that's still going to play a hundred percent of the snaps, and he's you know he's not a forty nine hundred guy, uh, but this is Sean Watson. We, we know he's got uh, plenty of upside to blast through this price tag just in general. Um, in throwing the football, but in rushing the football as well and scrambling. So this is actually a pretty a pretty okay play in my estimation. Um, Pittsburgh is more attackable through the air than they are on the ground. And I think playing some Deshaun and Amari and or DPJ stacks is, is warranted even at these price tags. I think this is a pretty contrarian way to uh, consider attacking um, the slate this week. Now, Nick Chubb for the Browns at 7,500. Uh, really not interested in this. Uh, Pittsburgh defense, rush defense, as I mentioned, is, is pretty excellent. So I uh, don't want to attack there. Even though Nick Chubb is still getting his 20-plus carries every single week, uh, the price tag just hasn't come down a little bit or enough. Um, it has come down a little bit, uh, but it hasn't come down enough for us to get super excited. And, and once again, what's a, another bad matchup? David Njoku, I'm just not playing the guy. Um, he is one of these tight ends, however, that is projecting okay at about 10 points, 2.5 point per dollar, mid-20s value score. It's fine at 3,900. Um, I'm just super biased, and and I hate playing this guy. So um, really no thank you. I, I'd much rather just get to the wide receiver room, target a deeper A dot with, with Amari Cooper, the shallower A dot type of builds with a DPJ, and then play Deshaun Watson. I think that the 5600 for Deshaun is, is a pretty good price. Uh, 2800 for the Browns defense here. I think this is in consideration. I think I'd rather play the Jets up here against Miami, for example, 200 bucks cheaper. Um, almost rather play the the. Patriots, I believe, at, at 2,200 or whatever they were um, against Buffalo. So, like, then then pay 2,800 for the Browns' defense. I think the Pittsburgh side over here is actually in a pretty damn good spot. Uh, Browns' defense overall isn't a very good unit, and I think there's going to be some scoring uh, from Pittsburgh's standpoint over here. I, I think Kenny Pickett at 5,000. I think this is one of the $5,000 quarterbacks that I'd rather play. I don't want to be getting to the backup quarterbacks necessarily, um, I'd rather just play a guy that's been playing all season and is really starting to turn around, turn it around for the Pittsburgh offense a little bit. Um, at 5,000, I think this is very playable. And let's, you know, don't get me wrong, Cleveland's uh, pass defense is certainly still very, very attackable. 5.8 adjusted net yards per attempt and 11 yards, 11.1 yards per catch. So uh, very attackable here for the Pittsburgh offense. It's just that they don't have a hell of a lot of um, realized upside this season in the passing game just yet. So I think my favorite way to play them would be Najee with six, at 6,100. I think this is a fantastic play here. Uh, price adjusted, I think it's great. The projection coming in at a full 15 points with a very low standard deviation uh, is really, really encouraging. And at, at this price tag... Two and a half point per dollar in mid 30s value score. It's very, very strong for a running back. At just 12% ownership right now, I think this is very playable because Cleveland is still one of the most attackable rush defenses in football, giving up 28 full attempts per game, 4.8 yards a carry, and 135 yards. And they give up some scoring as well with 1.3 touchdowns per. One of the worst numbers in the in in the league in in terms of um, point suppression. So. I think Najee's in a really, really good spot. They'll use him a little bit in the passing game as well. Dump off game, you know, he'll get three catches or, or whatever per game. I think that's perfectly fine. I think you can run a picket. I think you can run Najee. And then I would prefer to run him with Deontay Johnson at 5,200. I think this is fine also. 5,000, number or 5,200, uh, number one wide receiver in the offense. And mid mid two and a half point per dollar, give or take. And, and over 30 in value score. I think it's a fine play. Uh, still, they target leader and target share leader for the Pittsburgh offense. Um, he is questionable, so I have to keep an eye on him, but he's been questionable for the last like two months, I think. So uh, perfectly playable spot here for the Pittsburgh offense. You can play Pat Fryermuth as well. 3,800. I think he's a really, really good tight end play, to be quite honest. 2.8 point, point per dollar and over 30 va value score at 3,800. I, I think this is excellent. I'd much rather play Pat Fryermuth than David Njoku on the other side. Uh, so I think the Pittsburgh offense here is very playable. You can mix in some George Pickens. The 5,000 is probably a little elevated for him. Uh, he should be down at about 46, 44 maybe. Um, 
then we could consider, you know, really getting some outsized exposures to him. So I think I'd rather focus on the top three, top four guys here, Pickett, Najee, Deontay, and Fryermuth. Steelers defense, 3,200. Really not excited about this, to be quite honest. Um, I think they're a little bit overpriced, even though I, I do respect the unit. Uh, total in this game overall is, is still pretty low, but I, I do think the Browns have some some routes to put up some points here. And at 3,200, if the, if you're not getting turnovers, um, which is really kind of worrisome when you've got a, a mobile quarterback, uh, it really kind of nerfs, nerfs, uh, nerfs and nukes your your upside um, in that regard. So probably staying off of that, and I think there's some better defenses and better spots that we could consider playing. Okay, moving on to Tampa and Atlanta. Tampa, we can get through this one pretty quickly, I think. Tampa has absolutely nothing to play for whatsoever. I would be shocked if Tom Brady plays. Um, if he does play, it'll be for like two series. You know, there's no reason that any one of these number one uh, offensive skill position players should be on the field at all. They are locked into the number four seed, and you know they can't drop, they can't improve. So um, no reason whatsoever for for Brady, Godwin, Evans, or Fournette for that matter to to even put their uniforms on. None at all. So if Bowles does it, um, well he should probably be fired on the spot. I would say. Uh, Rashad White, I do think, is interesting. If if Fournette does end up sitting, um, then Rashad White probably won't. You know, they're going to need somebody to run the football here. And Rashad White actually is, in my estimation, the better back. Um, not quite as efficient in terms of just raw rushing metrics as Fournette. Um, but talent-wise, I think he's more talented. So uh, Rashad White at 5,400. I think this is one of the running backs you can mix into your pools. I think it's perfectly fine. And Keyshawn Vaughn may also get a little bit of of opportunity as well. At 4,700, I'm not excited about this at all. Um, the Bucks' rush offense in general has been terrible all season. But you could see an uptick just in general volume because it's likely to be Blaine Gabbert. Uh, that comes in and, and is under center. So they may still run the offense and still chuck the ball a little bit, uh, but I'm fully staying off of Chris Godwin and Mike Evans, not going anywhere near them. It would be like a Russell Gage of 4,400 that could see you know, a shift into the number one role. Um, and if he gets 8, 10 targets at, at 4,400 or something, I think that's a fantastic tournament play. Uh, but they have about 11 wide receivers here with Julio, with Scotty Miller, with Devin Tompkins. They also have Rashad Perryman and Tyler Johnson um, all on the roster. So you got to be really careful here if you're playing any of the Bucks' offense. I'm staying off of them pretty much entirely, even, um, even in the event that you know, we get some news that, hey, Blaine Gabbert's just going to come out and run the offense. Well, I'm still just kind of staying off of them. No, thank you. Uh, Atlanta on the other side, uh, once again, we can get through these guys pretty quickly. Tyler Algier, he's taken over the number one role, but Cordero Patterson is actually here at 5,300, still getting work, okay? And even though Algier is going to be the number one going forward, um, and projection-wise, projecting a full three points higher than Cordero at the moment, um, we know that Atlanta still wants to run the offense in a heavy, heavy, rush-heavy um uh, or rush dominant split, right? A full 60%. So um, that said, at eating 20% ownership on Tyler Algier and a 5,600 running back, I mean, yeah, he's obviously very talented, but Bucks defense, run defense, is actually fantastic over here. They're a really, really good unit. They're more attackable through the air. So if I were going to play any of a very rush-heavy offense, I think at this ownership number, a 20% for Tyler Algier. That looks a, a bit elevated to me, um, just given how much work Corderell Patterson's still going to get. He's 300 cheaper, Corderell, and you're getting him at a 7-to-1 ownership discount here. So um, if you give me 7-to-1 on Corderell Patterson outperforming Tyler Algier in a vacuum, I think you probably have to take it. Um, you know, you're, you're definitely a dog, but uh, I, think it's, I think that number is probably a bit too high, given the... the virtually uh, even workload split that, that, that they're employing right now. Desmond Ritter, I did mention that they are the Bucks the most attackable through the air. I saw Sam Darnold t tear them apart last week, so um, there's that. Des Ritter, you know, despite the fact that Atlanta does want to run the football, uh, they only throw the football 
uh, what about 24, 20, yeah, 24 attempts per game. Since Desmond Ritter has been the starter, he has eclipsed that number in each, right? And he's, he's actually eclipsed 30 attempts twice in two of his three starts, right? So there's upside more, uh, more upside rather, for Desmond Ritter to be throwing the football a bit more than um, Marcus Mariota in, in the previous, I guess, number one offense really employed, right? So Des at 49, I think he's playable in deep tournament stuff once again. Certainly, if, if Tampa's going to be resting guys in the defensive end as well, you can attack with Atlanta. I mean, Atlanta's laying four in this game. Um, if everybody were playing and healthy, I mean, it would be Tampa Bay laying four on the road. You know what I mean? So um, by, by most accounts, Atlanta is, at least in the betting markets, is going to be able to control this game here. So um, Dez and, and Drake London, both at 4900 These are very playable price tags. Very good value scores for both of these guys. 18% ownership for Drake London. I think the industry has finally caught on to this. Um, that I'm not super excited about. But um, So I'd probably just come in with the field or, or maybe a little lower. Probably don't want to be making the mistake of getting overweight Drake London here on a very rush-heavy offense to begin with, right? So uh, still staying off the Oli Zacchaeus here uh, at 3,200. I like the price, but once again, he's the second receiver on a team that runs the ball 60% of the time. No, thank you. Falcons defense, however, we haven't been able to play them really all season. I think this is an okay and playable spot here. Um, probably going to see fewer attempts through the air with Blaine Gabbard under center than you would with Brady, but, I mean, Blaine Gabbard is not... Tom Brady, you know what I mean? So um, with the entire, what's to be expected, the entire Tampa number one offense out, I think you could consider 2,400 Falcons defense here, 2.6 point per dollar and over 20 in value score. I think it's perfectly fine for some some point suppression uh, to attack there. I think that's a, a decent play. Uh, okay, so let's get to Carolina and New Orleans. Um Let's see, we're at about 45, 50 minutes. I'll see if I can get through this pretty quickly. Once again, we got a lot of games here. Um, and, you know, going as quickly as I can here. Uh, Carolina got there last week with DJ Moore. Uh, I think he's playable once again this week. I like the reduced ownership at just 11% this week compared to previous weeks or most weeks. I'm not super crazy about the 6,100 price tag. I'd rather play him than somebody we'll get to on the other side here in a second. Um Sam Darnold, I'm still not playing as well. I just don't think he's very good. Like, give me, like, give me Desmond Ritter and give me Kenny Pickett and give me Deshaun Watson. Give me all of these guys as opposed to Sam Darnold. Um, how would I want to attack the New Orleans defense? They're pretty mediocre, both in pass and rush defense. So uh, I think Deontay Foreman, 5,200, he's the number one running back, is splitting time, of course, with Chuba Hubbard here at 5,000. So that's a little bit worrisome, but at 5,200, he's still very explosive, and, and the New Orleans rush defense is very attackable still. So I think this is a guy you can mix into your pools. Would like to see the projection pop a little bit higher going into the weekend, so it wouldn't be my favorite play, but I think he's he's def definitely playable. Um, Panthers defense, 2,500. Once again, 2,500 defense in in a spot against a team that is not very explosive at all in New Orleans over here. Um I think that's very respectable. And if you land on them, uh, you're not going to get any argument from me. Probably staying off of the other tertiary and quaternary pieces uh, with Terrace Marshall, Visca, and Shai Smith, all of that kind of stuff. I really don't think there's going to be a hell of a lot of scoring in this game to begin with, so I would mostly be focusing on DJ Moore and Deontay Foreman. On the other side, for New Orleans, we still can't play the quarterback and passing game. Um, Andy Dalton and Taysom Hill basically splitting work right down the middle. Um, Alvin Kamara, their rush offense still stinks, and so I still don't think you can play him. Even at 6600 and a reduced price tag now compared to previous weeks, I still don't think you can play it. Um, the rush defense, this is a terrible fundamental spot against Carolina on the other side. They have a really, really good run defense. Four, let's see, uh, uh, I, I lost it over here on the other side. 4.3 yards of carry, 121 yards allowed per game on the ground for Carolina. So this is a very good spot. Uh, for their defense because New Orleans' rush offense is terrible, right? 4.2 yards of carry, just 115 aggregate yards per game on the season. Uh, no fantasy production coming from really pretty much anybody in the offense outside of Chris Olave. 6,200, like I said, I would almost rather just play DJ Moore on the other side, more confident that he's going to get a more solidified workload. 
Uh, and at 62, I think this is okay. I really love Chris Olave, of course, but um, not when he's got Andy Dalton and Taysom Hill splitting reps. And, you know, I mean, same thing with Rashid Shahid. I like the kid, and at 4,200 is a good price. 12% ownership, probably a little elevated. But projection-wise, he's a good, good value. And if I had to choose between the two, Olave and Shahid, I'd rather just play Shahid because he's 2,000 cheaper. And the projection is only about a point and a half off, right? He's a far better point per dollar and far better value score play. So uh, what really takes me off is the is the ownership, but a huge, huge standard deviation. So we've got some noise coming through in that number as of yet. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. Um, I, w- I like mixing him into tournament pools, but not super crazy about it because, once again, they're just not going to throw the ball a whole hell of a lot down here. Juwan Johnson, 3,700. Once again, Somebody that you could mix into your tight end pools. I think there's probably better plays this week, but um, at 3,700, he's he's perfectly fine. Saints defense, 3,500. I think they're totally unplayable at this price uh, compared to everybody else that we've got on the slate. So no thank you. Okay, Houston and the Colts. Uh, I think there could be a little bit of scoring here. Sneaky from Houston. Houston's been competitive. They've won a couple of games this year. They've been very competitive in some other games that they probably should have been. So um, Davis Mills still throwing the ball 45 times a game or 40 times a game, whatever it is. And at 5000 this is still playable price. Aggregate projection still super low for him. So that takes me off, and I'd rather just pivot up to a couple other guys. But uh, if you play some Houston, I think this is okay to you know, play some super deep tournament stuff. Only like 150s only, but uh, Brandon Cooks, Chris Moore are playable pieces at 4,800 and 4,000 respectively. I think they're you know point per dollar and value score uh, projecting just fine. Royce Freeman still getting the number one work, but he only got six targets or six carries last week. I think Dari also got very few carries. It, you know, like you can't mess around with the Freeman and, and Ogumbo Wale stuff in the um, Texans running back room. They've been a horrible rush offense all season. And uh, we really don't want to be attacking the Colts run defense anyway. Uh, they're also mixing in Rex Burkhead still, right? So no thank you. Uh, just the Brandon Cooks, Chris Moore, maybe, maybe, maybe in some super deep stuff, Davis Mills. Uh, Jordan Akins and Brevin Jordan and Tegan Katoriano and O.J. Howard, each one of the tight ends all getting snaps, not dealing with that either. However, Texans defense, 2,700. I mean, Colts defense been, or Colts offense been pitiful uh, really all season. They can't run the ball, and now they're getting uh, Sam Ellinger right back under center, who is likely to be chucking the ball a little bit. So there could be some increased opportunity for the Houston pass defense to capitalize on turnover or something like that. Not my favorite play at 27, but they're actually playable because really their only huge, huge weakness in terms of raw fantasy production allowed is to the running back, and that's Zach Moss territory. Unfortunately, you know, I'd really like Zach Moss at 5,200. I think it's a, a cheap play that you can include into your pools, but the once again, the Indiana uh, Indianapolis rush offense is just awful. Uh, they've been bad all season, and it's not just due to the lack now of Jonathan Taylor. So this is a good price-adjusted play. It's not a very good fundamental spot um, in in that regard. However, Houston is still the best fundamental spot in the league to attack with the running back. They give up a full 40 points per game. Um, excuse me, that's uh, that's the wrong number. Let me change that here. Here. To the running backs, it's actually 33 points a game, DK points a game. So very, very attackable still with running backs, and that's why I think you can leave Zach Moss into the pools. However, I'd most often like to attack with the Colts here against the Houston defense uh, with the places where I know where the targets are going, and that's Michael Pittman, that's Alec Pierce, maybe a little bit of Paris Campbell is the number two here, 4,300. Not super excited about that. Um, Jelani Woods is okay. Another one of these guys that you can mix into your tight end pools. Probably not my favorite play. I think there's other guys this week that you could land on that are uh, probably going to see a more solidified target and volume share. Colts defense, 3,100. I mean, you can always play the defense uh, against Houston. It really doesn't matter. They're okay. They're over 20 in value. Um, I think it's fine. Low ownership. If you land on it, it I wouldn't exit and, and re structure my entire team because of it, um, but not something I would go out of my way to play necessarily. Uh, okay, let's get to the afternoon games here. Trying to get through this as quickly as possible. Trying to keep it to, I don't know, maybe an hour 15 or something like that. Um, 
Arizona and San Francisco. Arizona obviously out, has been for a long time. They get David Blau again uh, under center, and San Francisco actually does have something to play for still. They can win this game, and they need Philly to lose, and uh, they can still win the one seed, right? So they're going to come out firing, and, and they're just going to run the offense here. Um, so if I had to if I had to lay anybody, uh, it'd probably just be the, the Niners here, but they're laying 14, I believe. So this is a huge, huge number. Um, James Conner, no thank you, 6,800. I think he's overpriced for this fundamental spot. And I just I don't want to attack San Francisco's defense. I think this is a bad, bad spot for Arizona. Marquise Brown, uh, he would be probably the only piece I'd, I'd – consider maybe some Trey McBride as well, but uh, Hollywood at 5,300, um, I think is a playable piece because David Blau, we did see last week that he, he threw it around a little bit, right? Uh, Trey McBride, I think, got 10 targets or something and, and caught a touchdown, so he popped. And I think Marquise Brown could uh, see a little bit more um, target work with DeAndre Hopkins once again being out. Uh so Greg Dortch here at 3,800, I, I certainly would rather play him this week, this week than last week when he popped for like 20% ownership and some stuff. Uh, no thank you there. But even at 3,800, I'm not super crazy about it. I'd rather just play Marquise Brown. And once again, this is a horrible, horrible fundamental spot for pretty much any opposing offense. I do not like attacking San Francisco uh, in general, even though it really would have worked out with, you know, the King Jarrett Stidham last week. Um Trey McBride, as I mentioned, 3,300. I think this is another one of these tight ends that you can mix into the pools. Probably the only two pieces from the Cardinals that I would be targeting, Hollywood and Trey McBride. Cardinals defense, no thank you, 2,100. They're probably going to give up 40, and it could be in the first half this week. I'm out. Uh, San Francisco on the other side. We've got to be careful here with CMC at 9,300, um, projecting right at the top as he does every single week, but the ownership is very high as well, full 25%. Now. San Francisco does have to win the game, so CMC is going to start. He's going to play, but they could very well have a 21 nothing or 24 nothing lead at halftime, and he could very well sit. So I think you're assuming a, a lot more risk than normal with when you're clicking a, a 9300 CMC here, uh, at least over on DK. Um, can't imagine that he's cheaper than that on, or you know, relatively cheaper than that on Fanduel anyway. So uh, fundamentally, I think this is a really tough spot to be. Um, clowning around with the, the 9,300, 9,000 guys and, and all this sort of stuff. Really kind of a tough spot for San Francisco's offense to get to in general just because of the pricing, not because of the fundamental spot against Arizona, who's obviously bad. But uh, Brock Purdy really doesn't have a whole hell of a lot of upside um, individually at 5,700 because the offense itself is just so balanced. They're literally 50-50 split right down the middle, rush pass heavy. So... It's difficult. Like, even last week, they put up 37 points against the Raiders, and Purdy only had, like, I think, 18 DK points or something around there. So, um, you know, they're, they have plenty of ways to score, and that could come from CMC. It could come from a Tyrion Davis price down here or a Kyle Hughes check, right? They could play Jordan Mason as well. Um, Brandon Ayuk got a price bump finally, 6,800, but. You know, so Debo might even come back, but he's probably only going to play a couple of series, if anything. So you can't play really either one of those guys. And then George Kittle, I think most of the value is extracted at this price tag. Like he's somebody that you could mix in, but there's cheaper guys that are projecting just as well. And at lower ownership, I think I'd rather play than George Kittle. So in this respect, I mean, yeah, you want to punt to Jawan Jennings? I mean, okay, but... um. In this respect, I think that's why the, the San Francisco offense, despite the fact that they're laying a huge number, it's kind of difficult to get to. I think you're taking a, on a, a bit more risk at these price tags that the upside would really afford you in the event that you're right. Um, I think my favorite play in the game here is probably just going to be the 49ers defense, 4,100. I hate paying up for a defense, but a full 10-point projection, 2.5 value score and a uh, or a 2.5 point per dollar and a mid-20s value score for a $4,100 defense is out of control. Like, this is super, super high and very rare. Um, and they do get David Blau, who will throw it a little bit and is certainly not immune to turning the football over on the other side. So I think this is a really, really good play and a very low ownership, one of the better defensive plays of the week. 
Okay, Chargers and Denver. We got to keep an eye on what happens in the Baltimore and Cincy game. Um, if Baltimore loses this game, then I believe the Chargers are locked into the five seed. At which point, Staley has already come out and and said that they're probably going to sit their guys. Uh, he didn't really say that effectively, um, or he, you know, explicitly rather. Uh, but he said that effectively, right? Uh, well, we'll keep an eye on it and we'll see. You know, we'll make decisions at that kind of, you know, just kind of the coach speak or whatever he did. Um, that basically means that Herbert, Eckler, Keenan Allen, Mike Williams are almost certainly going to sit. They could very well come out for like two series or something, and, and that's it. Um, so you got to keep an eye on, if you're getting heavy exposure to the Chargers, uh, be very, very careful, and you better be right on it. Luckily, they, are, they did push all of these afternoon games back to a full uh, 425 here. So usually all the games in the in the morning are, are all completed by then, but uh, keep an eye on it. You could see something wild here, the Baltimore Cincy game. This game could go into overtime, and the Chargers Denver game could could start. Um, and if you're sitting on a, a lot of exposure to the Chargers, you could very well be sitting on a bunch of dead teams. So I'd be very careful here. Certainly at these price tags, uh, 8900 for Eckler. I I I like the kid, and I I love the spot for him. Um, in the event that the Chargers do have to play this game, like if Baltimore wins, I think the Chargers still have to, they have to win themselves to lock into the five. And that's a very significant move because the winner of the five, or excuse me, the uh, five seed gets the winner of the uh, Tennessee and Jacksonville game, who would be the four seed uh, that happens on Saturday night. And both of those matchups for the Chargers are significantly better. Either Tennessee's pass defense or Jacksonville's pass defense for the Chargers offense, right? Then the event that they'd have to go to Arrowhead and play the number one or uh, Buffalo and Arch Orchard Park and, and play the Bills up there or play Cincinnati, right? They don't want to go to any one of these, um, these stadiums and play these guys. They'd much rather just go to Jacksonville or Tennessee and, and take their chances. So they got to win this game in the event that they got to win the game, right? So got to keep an eye on that. Um, but I do really like the spot for the offense in the event that they do have to play it. Um, not so much on Keenan Allen necessarily. He's going to get Pat Sertan. And I, I do think Denver is going to come out here and, and fire away pretty hard. So, you know, just to end their season on a, on a good note, they actually look pretty damn respectable last week. Uh, we'll get to them in a sec. But I think my favorite way to play it in the event that everybody plays would be Mike Williams, 6600 I think this is a good price, very intriguing price tag for him. Might have to force a little bit of this in uh, because he's expensive and value-wise not projecting as high as you'd want somebody in the, in the 6600 range to project. But it's still very playable. And he's not going to get the number one cover corner over there from Denver. So uh, I think this is very playable in the event that they have the entire offense out there. In the event that they don't, I'm probably, well, in any event, I'm, I'm probably staying off the Josh Palmer. I think he's probably too expensive because he would get Pat Sertan, assuming that it's just Keenan Allen and, and Mike Williams that sit. Um if they if they sit everybody right, he would get Pat Sertan, which is a horrible matchup, and which means at 5,500 he's way overpriced. Um, I'd probably want to pivot that to DeAndre Carter, for example, at at 5,100 if I had any Chargers exposure and I couldn't get off of it. Um, how do I pivot off of Austin Eckler? Well, it's down to Josh Kelly. He'll actually get some work. I think this could be a, one of the better. It is certainly a really good late slate play. Um, at 5,600 for a running back. Uh, in the event that Eckler sits, then Josh Kelly's going to get all the rushing work, and Denver is very attackable on the ground. That's certainly the the way we'd prefer to attack. It'd, it'd be with running backs and, and a pass-catching running back, Josh Kelly. Um, you might have a Xander Horvath backing him up, but he's not, he's not going to get all that much work, right? So um, really have to keep an eye on what's going on with the Baltimore and Cincinnati game because that directly affects everything that happens here with the Chargers. Uh, I'm not playing the Chargers defense 3,600, even against a bad offense over in Denver. Uh, I think they may, I've said this several times this season, so, you know, don't believe me, but I think they may have unlocked a little bit of something last week in the sense that uh, Russ Wilson um, 
you know, he scrambled a little bit. So at 5,400, I think this is a playable price tag for him. He gets 4,800 Cortland Sutton down here. That seems like a pretty damn good play to me. Um, uh, Chargers defense, pretty attackable through the air for sure. Jerry Judy, 6,300. He's kind of assumed the quote number one role, I suppose. Um, so I think he's still playable as well. Not crazy about the, the value scores here for these guys. I think the best spot though, is going to be Lat Murray at 5,400, um, in addition to Russ, right? The Chargers have been attackable very much so on the ground all season long. So uh, I, d- I do like this spot for, for Lat Murray, and I like it even more if the Chargers have to uh, or do not have to to do anything to solidify the, the five seed if Baltimore wins that game. So um, I like getting to some of the Broncos' offense here a little bit. I think they, they can compete, and certainly... You know, I, I like stacks more for Denver, Russ, Judy, Cortland Sutton. You could maybe mix in an Albert O. Okawebenom here as well um, with Greg Dulcich out. Uh, I like them more in the event that the Chargers have to play, of course. Um, if if the Chargers don't have to play, I'd probably just pivot most of my stuff to, to one-offs of Cortland Sutton and some Latavius Murray from the Broncos' perspective. 2500 for the Broncos' defense. Uh, really only like this in the event that the Chargers' number ones don't play. Um, I did mention Albert Okawebunam here. Uh, Dulcich will be out. You could mix him in, but they're going to use two other tight ends as well with Eric Saubert and Eric Tomlinson, I believe. Um, but Albert O, they, they like him coming into the season, so he's Somebody that if you're building a bunch of Denver stacks, maybe on the late slate uh, or something like that, you could consider as a tight end play. Uh, okay, Giants in Philly. Giants have nothing to play for here. I'm not touching Saquon, of course, not touching Dimes. I believe it's going to be Terod Taylor starting under center. Uh, I don't really want to attack the Philly pass defense. They are fantastic. Philly actually has to win this game to solidify the number one seed in the in the NFC. So uh, I'm not going anywhere near the Giants here. Um the only piece that you could consider would be a Matt Breida or a Gary Brightwell as the backup running back plays. Probably just Matt Breida. Um, but even in that event, I'm almost fully staying off at the Giants offense. They're probably just going to get blown out here because Philly's going to come out firing on all cylinders. And that certainly means that I'm not going to be playing even a very, very cheap 2200 uh, Giants defense. So Philly on the other side, Jalen Hurts, it, it is going to be him. But we got to be careful with him when we're clicking 8,200, not because of a lack of upside or, you know, any of that. Um, if they're blowing out the Giants, which I mostly kind of expect here, the the possibility that Jalen Hurts actually only plays the first half and then sits for Gardner Minshew is actually very real. Um, I think it getting exposure to him and just, like, saying, well, to hell with it, if, the, if that's what happens, uh, then so be it. Uh, I'm going to lose out on the value from Jalen Hurts. Uh, that's okay. Um, I, I think that's a fine way to approach it. And I just playing with AJ Brown, playing with Devontae Smith, play some Dallas Goddard with him as well, and and just and just run it. I think that's okay since Philly has to come out firing. And you know this is a, a still a divisional game. We can't really totally expect that it's only going to be a blowout. There are routes uh, and ranges of outcomes where the Giants do compete in this game still. So. There are scenarios where Jalen Hurts does end up playing the, the entire game. Um, obviously, seeing a, a huge bit of steam on or ownership steam on Miles Sanders so far. That's because the Giants are terrible in rush defense. They have been all season. Uh, if you want to get off of a little bit of this, because we never really like playing Miles Sanders when he's popular, 5900 is a good price, of course, but um, the ownership of 20% is is very very high. So if you want to get off a little bit of this, I think just pivoting right to the passing game is a perfectly respectable way to play this and you can play AJ Brown you can play Devontae Smith you can play some Dallas Goddard once again at 4900 I I like this better that Jalen Hurts is is back he'll likely see a more solidified target share in that event um but probably still some variance because he, he hasn't seen a hell of a lot of work since he came back himself and in the event that Minshew does come in and play the second half um or, or whatever it is then Dallas Goddard, like the upside for him at 4,900, likely to be nuked pretty hard. So um, Eagles defense, I think this is a playable unit. Like this at 4,000, probably rather play the the Niners over here. Uh, but they're getting, the, the Eagles here, they're getting a full number two offense effectively. Um, 
So I think this is a pretty damn good play as well. I think paying up for a defense this week is an okay play. Pretty, you know, over two point per dollar and over 20 value score for a defense at 4,000. Uh, it's kind of hard to do. So uh, I think this is perfectly playable. Probably not going to be dipping down into the Quez Watkins or Kenneth Gainwell type of stuff. If you want to pivot in deep tournament stuff, you're getting a lot of exposure to Philly. You want to pivot off of some of the Miles Sanders. You can play some sort of touchdown variance Kenneth Gainwell shares at 4,300. I think I'd probably rather play Khalil Herbert, to be quite honest, at 4,600 in that event. But uh, I think that's something to consider in very deep tournament stuff. Okay, try and get through these last two quickly. Uh, Dallas and Washington, once again, Dallas can still win the one seed, and they could win the division if, even if they don't win the one seed. Um, they got to win. They need Philly to lose in both scenarios. They win the one seed if San Francisco also loses, um, but they just win the division with the head-to-head -head and, and the other tiebreaker. Uh, I believe it's the divisional record between Dallas and Philly. Um, Dallas would have a better division record than than the Eagles in the event that uh, that they tie for the division lead or whatever it is, um, which would be a, a Dallas win and a Philly loss. <clears throat> so they still got to play, and that means I think we can get to some Dak, some Dak Prescott and some CeeDee Lamb. 6600 I think this is an okay price tag here considering all the other options on the slate that we have. Um, and for, you know, one of the better teams in the NFC, you know, let's not get a – get things twisted here they could very well end up the one seed here uh i mean well not very well but they could win the division right and be the number two seed so um this is a good football team here still don't really want to attack with the run game Seven thousand sixty-three hundred for pollard and, and zeke elliott respectively uh i think they're a bit expensive and the washington run defense is still a very very good unit even though they could very well lay down and, and just kind of roll over. Uh, you could see Pollard and Zeke or you know, whatever pop through these numbers, but I think it's uh, lower probability than would be otherwise. Um, favorite plays would just be Dak and CD here. Uh, CD at, at 8,200, I'm not super crazy about the price tag. Um, and I think I'd almost rather play Steph Diggs in a vacuum, you know, one to one. Uh, definitely would rather play Jamar Chase. But uh, I think CD is a perfectly good good you know late slate or even a flex play at lower ownership he's definitely got the upside he could he could run for well you know whatever catch eight balls and um for 165 yards and two scores here and uh, you'll basically need him in that event right so uh dalton schultz i think this is an interesting tight end play this week probably not crazy about it um you know, the, the value metrics are a little bit lower than we'd like to see for a tight end of 4,500. I think in the next game we'll get to the tight end I'd, I'd prefer. Um, and, you know, despite the fact that he's had a little bit of an uptick in volume over the last couple of weeks, um, I think these, you know, he would be the number two favorite, I suppose, uh, you know, behind CD. If you're, if you're running Dak and Dalton Schultz stacks, I don't think that's terrible. Dak, CD, and Dalton Schultz. Um, you know, not the worst thing in the world. We'll get to Washington here in a sec. Um, Noah Brown and Michael Gallup probably just staying off of them, but Michael Gallup has upside at 4,100 for sure. Uh, I think it's a deeper tournament dart that you could consider as well. Cowboys defense 39. I think they're in the same conversation with San Francisco and Philly here. It's just a price thing. Uh, if you land on, like, I prefer San Francisco and then Philly and then Dallas really in that order, and that's how they're priced. Um but if you need the extra 200 bucks or something, play the Cowboys. I mean, it's perfectly fine. Okay, interesting scenario over here for the Commanders. Uh, Sam Howell, is. it looks like he's going to be getting the start. He is a rookie out of uh, Carolina. And um, he actually went to school with Diami Brown down here. And I think he's a really cool, like, super deep tournament dart that you could consider. Maybe a Sam Howell to Diami Brown. Uh, they did this a hell of a lot in college. They're just chucking the ball. He's got a good rapport. And, like, there's a non-zero chance that these guys just get together and be like, yo, I'm going to hit you for a 75-yard touchdown pass. Let's hit it. You know, and, you know, so I think this, if you want to throw a, a deep dart, I, I'm not sure if I'd play Sam Howell necessarily. Dallas pass defense pretty okay. Um, but a one-off Diami Brown, I think, is a, pretty interesting and shrewd play like super low probability uh but at, at the stone minimum if you want to use it as a run back in in some of your dallas stacks i think that's an an okay and playable piece um 
I'd probably rather get to the passing game here, despite the fact that the Cowboys' pass defense is overall pretty respectable, and that's mostly because Brian Robinson hasn't practiced all week. Um, They don't have a hell of a lot of upside in the run game as it is, does Washington, and Antonio Gibson as a running pure rushing back um, really doesn't have a, all that much upside himself. So um, he would be a pretty decent flex play as well at 5,000 if in the event that Brian Robinson doesn't play. Uh, I think it's pretty good, actually. And, um, you know, but overall, I think targeting the Washington offense, I think they're playable, but uh, only in deep, deep stuff and probably just as, you know, most often just as, as runbacks in Dallas stacks. Uh, but you can certainly play Terry McLaurin. He's going to get a guy that can throw the football a hell of a lot more efficiently than either Taylor Heineke or Carson Wentz. I mean, Sam Hell is he's mobile. Uh, Sam Howell is mobile as well at 4,900. It's, it's not the worst play in the world. Not projecting all that high just because it's literally his first game. Um, but you could consider some super deep tournament stuff, very skinny stacks of a Howell and McLaurin, Howell and a Jahan Dotson, um, a Howell and a Diami Brown, as I mentioned, or even mixing in a Curtis Samuel. Uh, if you want to game stack this down here, I, I don't think this is bad, mixing in a Terry McLaurin, a Diami Brown, and running Dak, CD, and like a Dalton Schultz or something on the other side. I think it's really interesting. And... A, a full-on game stack, I think, could get there. Commander's defense, we're not gonna we're not gonna deal with at 2300 when Dallas has something to play for. Okay, uh, once again, pretty long here, uh, almost done. Rams, this is a cool late slate game, I think. Um, Seattle actually is locked into the or not locked in. They are holding on to the the final seed in the NFC right now. They have to win, and if they win, they are almost certainly in. I believe they could maybe lose a tiebreak of like a fourth level tiebreaker to the Packers if they win as well maybe um but if the if the Lions win that game and Seattle wins as well then Seattle wins the tiebreaker against the Lions in the head-to-head matchup when they beat them earlier in the season so Seattle still has to win here and the Rams pass defense is actually very attackable so you could see Seattle and Geno will get back to the quarterback page here um you know shortly but Geno actually projects up near the top of the quarterback room this week. Uh, Baker, however, does not. Uh, naturally, it's just going to be pretty low. This is an attackable spot for the Seattle, um, or for the Rams offense against the Seattle pass defense. So I think getting to Tyler Higby, he's one of my favorite tight end plays of the week up there with um, with uh, Pat Fryermuth and, and, and these kind of guys um i think this is really really strong 4400 and the ownership is pretty low i think it's a good late slate play i think it's a good main slate play uh tutu atwell he's popping once again in ownership and value scores down here 3400 i think this is a fine one-off probably just a late slate late slate play i think i'd rather prefer to get to uh, a demarcus robinson at 3600 in the baltimore game than a tutu here um but Basically, like Baker and and Tyler Huntley are, are effectively equals in that re- respect. So it's it's kind of throwing darts either way. Cam Akers, I really do like. Uh, 6200, not my favorite on the main slate, but really do like him on the late slate for sure. At 15% ownership, I think this is probably a little bit aggressive given all of the other options that we have um, in the running back room. I think I'd, I'd, I'd much rather just play Najee, right? Um, but this is a good flex play in the late game. He's certainly playable. I'm not touching any any of the rest of the offense. Uh, just no thanks. Same thing with the Rams defense, 2,400. Like, Seattle's going to be chucking it, uh, which is okay, but really just not interested um, overall. Even though their run defense is pretty good, that that really just only takes me off of Kenneth Walker at 6,400. Would rather play Akers on the other side, and I'd rather play some other guys than Akers. You know what I mean? So Kenneth Walker, I think, is is pretty far down the list for me um, outside of stack plays. Uh, admittedly, a strong value score here, and 15% ownership is very palatable. Um, Gino, however, look at this number. Full 19 projection on DK here at, at, at 6,000. Killer value score. Uh, this is a really, really good play here against the Rams' pass defense. I think you can play him on the main slate. I think you can play some Seattle with Geno, DK, and Tyler Lockett. Um, I think there's maybe, you know, these price tags here on, on Metcalf and Lockett in particular, certainly with Geno at 6,000, right? I, I think the um, all of the upside 
is, is probably not priced in, but a lot of the upside probably is. Um, but they're going to come out firing here, and they're going to do everything they can to win this game and and get into the playoffs. So I think this is perfectly playable here. Uh, you can play these guys on in in pretty much any kind of proportion. Uh, I think this is a, a pretty good spot for them. Um, probably not playing the tight end, Noah Fant, because they're still using a secondary tight end, Colby Parkinson. He actually got a touchdown pass last week, I believe. So uh, really not dealing with any of that. Mostly just sticking to Geno, DK, Tyler Lockett. And I will have some... Um, exposures to you know a Kenneth Walker as well just in stacks though uh, okay so that's it for the full game breakdown um, I don't think we skipped anybody I hope not um, but I'm not going to go over stacks or anything you know once again a lot of variance here in, in, in week 18 um, you know I guess if, if you want a couple of favorite stacks I do like Seattle I like Dallas I like some Philly a little bit I think I'd prefer Dallas to Philly uh, like Philly pieces for sure um, in the event that the Baltimore and Cincinnati game, you know, forces the Chargers to play, then I like Denver and I like the Chargers here, uh, of course. Um, I think you can play some Pittsburgh. I think you can play some Browns. Uh, and certainly you can play both Cincinnati. You can play a little bit of Baltimore and both Buffalo and New England up here, probably staying off of full stacks everywhere else. But uh, all of these teams are once again in a full 13-game slate. You can get to pretty much everybody. Um outside of Tampa and the Giants who aren't playing their number ones, you know. So uh, that's really how we have to kind of approach it this week. I hope that helped, guys. Um, and once again, keep an eye out for the projections, updates. We're going to have as many as as possible going into the weekend here, but you really got to be sharp um, coming into the, the final week of the season uh, with news because we're, we're likely to have some, some surprises come Sunday morning when inactives come out as well. So um, don't rule any of that out, but keep an eye out for the projections updates and just keep your uh, your ears peeled. Um, if we are punting anything this week. So uh, it's been a fantastic regular season. Uh, I hope everybody has, has gotten some value out of some of these breakdowns. I know I certainly have myself um, and of the projections themselves, right? This is, uh, I believe, uh, a pretty unique product that we're, we're providing here at, at true DFS. Um, and I think there's a good bit of value that we can glean going forward. We're going to be putting this up for other sports as well. Um, so keep an eye out for all of that. But, uh, as far as the NFL is concerned, that's really it. We're going to have playoff stuff and, and all that kind of jazz going forward too. But, um, not sure if I'm going to be doing videos necessarily, but, uh, if this is the last time I talk to you guys for the NFL season, uh, once again, thanks for joining us, and uh, good luck to you all, um, and let's get it.